Welcome to the Law School Insider, where we have conversations with students, lawyers, and employers. Succeeding in law school is something that you must prepare for, not only before you begin, but throughout your law school journey, and that's what this podcast is all about. I am your host, Dr. Christopher Lewis, and I will draw from my over 20 years of experience in the college admission field, as well as bring forth the experiences of others as we delve deeper into the issues. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Law School Insider. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Lewis. I'm so excited to be able to have you back again this week. This week, I am excited to introduce you to Lori Budeweg, who is a principal shareholder with Nicholas Sachs, Slank, Sendelbach, and Budeweg, which is a law firm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, She is the past president of the State Bar of Michigan and has a long career of advocating for ethical standards and rights for her clients. And, you know, we are really excited to be able to have her on the show today to share her own experiences, but also to have her share some of her thoughts on success and how she got there. So, Lori, thanks so much for joining the show this week. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You know, I am really excited to be able to have you on today. You're going to be a speaker at our upcoming graduation here at Western Michigan University <laughs> Cooley Law School, and I, I am excited am. to hear what you have to say there as well. And today, though, what I want to do, and what, this is what I do with all of our guests, is I turn the clock back just a little bit and talk to you a little bit about the journey. Talk to you about the journey that you took to find the success that you have found in your own career, and You've been in your career for a number of years. You've built a a thriving practice in family law. Mm -hmm. Now, as you think back and you look back at the law itself, what was it about the law that specifically drew you in? What made you want to go into this profession from the beginning? (laughs) Right. Well, I think I realized at a pretty early age, actually around ninth grade, um, that law is like the great equalizer, Right, so it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic or racial background is, your ethnic background, your religious background, that the law is to protect everyone, equal protection under the law. I think in particular, what drew my attention to a legal uh, career back in high school was to I kept witnessing bullying you know in high school before bullying was a thing before parents or administration sort of got involved and tried to really do anything about it, certainly before there were any anti-bullying laws. And, you know, you would witness that sort of thing happening. And I think for some, it would just invoke a great deal of not so much anger, but you wanted to do something about it. You wanted to somehow help the person who really didn't have maybe the skill set to help themselves. So I think I decided back in about ninth grade that I was going to become a crusader for the downtrodden. (laughs) Now, you decided to go to law school after on your undergraduate experiences. And as you were making those decisions and you made that transition into law school, you decided to do some things in law school that have helped that helped you to kind of find your niche and find your way. But were there specific things that you did in law school that you feel set you up for success for the career that you have been in? Well, to put it all in perspective, law school was a bit of a blur for me. You know, I had attended the University of Michigan undergrad and double majored in Spanish and economics through the Honors College. And that was full time. I I worked very hard in undergrad so that I could get into law school. And then once I was in law school, you know, I was I was on my own for for tuition and for housing and all of that, which was new to me. So I could not afford to go to law school during the day. And so I got a full-time job during the day and worked uh, 40 hours a week as a law clerk summarizing deposition transcripts and medical records and visiting accident scenes with accident reconstructionists and helping them do surveys. And with sometimes, oftentimes, we'd go with the police officers out to the scene and they'd show us where things happened. So I did that all day long and then I went to night school at Wayne State and we didn't start classes till about 6, 10 p.m. Usually 
really didn't eat much for dinner, uh, junk food, really, unfortunately, and then would sit through class till about 8 or 8.30, depending on how long the class was, and then drive from Wayne State back to Southfield, where I had an apartment and where I worked, and then try and read up for the next day whatever I hadn't done ahead on the weekend. So, And then I went in the summers as well, went weekends in the summers. I did a student trial advocacy program in the summer. I always took at least three credits in the summer. So I managed to do a five-year night school program in four, and really I only incurred $12,000 in law school debt, which in this day and age I think is remarkable probably and, and managed to pay that off pretty quickly. So I always say it was a very good return on investment. So as far as what did I do in law school to position myself for my career, uh, I guess working really, my answer would have to be, if anything, it was it was working, but it wasn't necessarily by design or plan. It was just because I had to. But that job that I had during law school is what made the connection for me to my first law firm. We were often co-defense counsel in, this, in these cases involving train accidents and car accidents, and I got married right after law school. My husband started uh, his law school career at the University of Michigan Law School right after I graduated from Wayne. So we needed to move to Ann Arbor because they don't have a night school at U of M. He was going to be going full-time, and I'd be working full-time. So I needed to get a job in an Ann Arbor law firm. And like I said, that's how I made the connection to get the interview there was from the firm that I had clerked at. We often worked with Conlon, McKinney, and Philbrook, which was my first firm. And so that's how I got my start, working as an associate there. And then after 10 years there, decided I wanted to specialize in just one practice area. So that's why I joined Nichols, Sachs, Slink, Sendelbach, and Budweig, because they're a boutique family law firm. And I think, in my opinion, it's much easier to really to, to rise to the top of your field if you are specializing in it and not having to keep up with the laws in multiple different areas of practice. Completely understand that, and I appreciate you sharing that as well. Now, you called yourself a, that back when you were younger, you wanted to be a crusader. You wanted to help the downtrodden, and from what I have seen, you conti- have continued to do that. And there's a number of law students that come into law school with that idea, with the concept that they want to help others, and this being a helping profession. But there are others that need to learn some of those skills and learn some of those advocacy skills. As you have gone through your career, what are some of the skills that you have had to grow and to learn for yourself that have helped you to be successful? And what are some of those skills that others should be working on as they're going through law school and getting into their career? So that's a really good question. And I'll preface it by saying I think it is a skill that develops over time. It's sort of what part and parcel to the definition of experience. When we talk about being an experienced lawyer, experienced lawyers are lawyers who are really good at counseling as well as lawyering. And in the domestic relations arena, both of those are extremely important. So how did I try to improve my skills as a counselor? I'll tell you, it's something I absolutely had to improve upon. There's no question. It's not something that you're necessarily born with or that comes easy. At Nichols Sachs, the senior partner there, Margot Nichols and, and Monica Sachs would both have me sit in initial consultations where they would counsel clients. So I learned a lot from them. And at first, I was really surprised at the kind of intimate counseling that would go on in these consultation sessions as basically a civil litigator, for the most part, before doing just family law, you know, those were kind of boundaries that you just didn't cross, you know, with clients. It was, you talked about things that were really, really personal as you have to in family law. And so, you know, there was sort of a big learning curve getting over into that comfort zone of being able to talk to people about things that are sort of awkward, but it grows on you over time and you just I think with more experience, you get better at it. I would say what has supplemented my in-house learning experience has also been my, you know, the spiritual side of my life. I happen to have gone to a church for 10 years with an extremely good pastor with great homilies and great wisdom. And it's It's difficult not to take away lessons from those homilies that can help you when you're 
working with people who are going through the kinds of troubles that this pastor would be preaching about. And also, I have a regular yoga practice. I've been practicing yoga once a week for five years now. And there are a number of laws of yoga that really, you know, just ring true as you're talking to people about their issues and and dealing with them and, and even opposing counsel. So I would say trying to glean wisdom from whatever other areas of your life that you're comfortable with and that speak to you outside of just, you know, the books, the statutes and the the court rules and the rules of professional conduct, which of course are the foundation. But I think these outside sources of information and wisdom can really, really be helpful to young lawyers as they start their practice. That's great advice. And now I want to ask you a question too, because um, outside of being a counselor, you were able to grow into a position where you became the the, pa- the you know, now a past state bar president of Michigan, but you grew into the position of being able to be the state bar of Michigan president. And, uh, and that is a position that is something that people see the, the benefit that you have given to the profession in the state. And then you have the opportunity to go out and be able to interact with so many other lawyers and you see positives, you see negatives, and you see the things that are that people are bringing into the profession. So I'm sure that you had some great takeaways from that time in office. Are there specific things that you learned in that year where you were the state bar president that you might want to share with people that are coming into the profession, things that could help them to, again, find that success as they're going through law school and beyond? What did I learn? A lot of different things that might be helpful to uh, new lawyers and law students. One thing I learned is there is a really, really big need for attorneys in the more rural areas of the state, certainly in the Upper Peninsula where we only have 459 attorneys out of 45,000. You know, we have over 10,000 in Oakland County. So if you like the great outdoors, you like the more rural areas, it's beautiful in these more rural areas, you know, you can be a big fish in a little pond. Sometimes it's difficult to find clients who can pay a lot, but also the cost of living tends to be lower in some of those areas sometimes. But but that's not always true. I mean, there are oftentimes there are plenty of clients who are able um, to pay whatever, you know, the going rate is necessary to run a a successful practice. I mean, that's one thing I learned is that the state is incredibly diverse when it comes to saturation of attorneys. So many times you hear young law students and lawyers saying, it's really so hard, it's impossible to find a job. Well, there is always a need for attorneys in in the more rural areas of the state. That being said, I think just setting up, opening up your own practicing and hanging out a shingle can be a really perilous thing to do without finding a a local mentor to help out or perhaps joining an existing practice so that you have that mentoring. And as much experiential learning as students can get in law school, really encourage that. Those are just invaluable lessons working in clinics or private practices, doing internships, being a law clerk, anything you can do to get yourself into a law firm while you're still in law school can be helpful in that regard. What else did I learn? Just generally speaking, you know, lawyers, attorneys throughout the whole state, uh, they're all I, I didn't I didn't meet any of them that I didn't like. I mean, they're all, they're all uh, out there trying to, you know, help others. And I think we just have that as a common thread. All of us are trying to do that as best we can with the resources that we have available to us. The whole population of attorneys is very inspiring. And I just think it's really important as you go through practice to build a, a niche for yourself in your practice area. A lot of attorneys are now sort of creating their own practice niche. For example, um, one of our past State Bar presidents, Julie Fershman, is sort of known as 
the national equine lawyer, and she does everything to do with horses, whether it's contracts to purchase a horse or breeding or a personal injury involving a horse or you want to open up a horseback riding a cup business and have contracts and, and liability waivers, anything like that. And she speaks all over the country about horse law. Um, she created that niche all on her own. I know of another student whom I follow on Twitter and uh, she's doing fashion law. And so she just loves fashion. So I, you know, I say, Find what is your passion, identify your passion, and surely there is some legal element or aspect to that passion that you could work on and develop. So that would be another bit of wisdom or uh, advice I would give. And then another thing is do join your local bar association, specialty bar association, or state bar section and become active in those areas because that's how you meet attorneys from all around the state in speaking with them, you know, share information and they get to know you, they build a comfort level with you and you get referrals, you know, from my, you know, people maybe calling you from their hometown and saying, oh, I have an old buddy who called me, I'm the only lawyer he knows and is looking for a referral in Washtenaw County for family law and I thought of you. So just get out there. Get out there and be seen. Be seen everywhere you can as much and as often as you you can be seen. Some people say, well, I can't. I'm a new student. I'm a new new lawyer. I can't really afford all these dues and this and that. Well, it's it's money well spent. You've got to spend money on marketing to some extent, and that I would put it in that category. Not only are you doing good things for the profession by belonging to those professional membership, you're also getting yourself out there. Well, Lori, you shared some amazing tips and resources today. I'm going to put a couple of links to the State Bar of Michigan for people to be able to explore some of the areas there. Is there anything else, any other final tips or hints or things that you want to share with our listeners today to help them to find the success that you have been able to find in your own career? Not focusing on yourself or not worrying about yourself, but rather trying to always think about, you know, what's what's the right thing to do? How do I serve the greater good? It's just reminding yourself, you know, it's not all about me. Stay humble, work hard, and somebody gives you one of those no buttons, put it in a drawer and shut the drawer because you have to say yes. You have to say yes to cases that are hard. You have to say yes to pro bono cases. You have to say yes to helping out with your profession. And you just have to double down. I'm, you know, it's not easy, but it's very fulfilling and very satisfying. I just wish the best to all the listeners out there and invite anybody who, you know, wants to, to talk to me personally or certainly free to, to give me a call or send me an email. Happy to talk to any of your listeners. Well, I appreciate you being on the show this week. I will, um, I'm going to leave your contact information in this and I encourage all of you to reach out as we have in the past. Whenever somebody gives you an opportunity to make a connection, use it and build your own network. Just like Lori was just saying about the importance of getting involved with your local state bar associations and also the national associations. There are so many ways that when you make those connections, you need to make sure that you are fostering them and you are you're working with those people so that they get to know you, you get to know them, and so on. So, Lori, thanks so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate it, and we look forward to keeping in touch in the future. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, that was another great guest this week on the Law School Insider. If you have an interest in being a guest on the show, drop me an email at lawschoolinsider at cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y dot E-D-U. And thank you all for listening today. And remember, you have the ability and right to take control of your law school success. I hope you'll continue listening, creating a plan for success that will prepare you to achieve the dreams that you have set for yourself. Talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. You're on your way to being a law school insider. Please subscribe to stay connected and come back again next time as we speak to more students, lawyers, and employers. Thank you.